when you are international, you also get permission to be a little weird, a little different. This is the Talent Show, a new podcast series from FT Talent, a hub of innovation from the Financial Times, hosted by under 30s for the under 30s around the world. This first series is in partnership with Bocconi University, a leading higher education institution of business and managerial advancements. I am Virginia Stagni, and this is the guide you need to drive innovation and change. Today, we are focusing on global strategy by talking with an expert who researches the challenges that multinational companies face when operating in different markets. This is for any listener who aspires to be a strategist, desires to work in different countries with different languages, and generally wants to better understand the world beyond their own country's borders. Here is our conversation with Charles Williams, professor of strategy at Bocconi University. Charlie, how are you doing? How are you and where are you? I'm good. I'm good. Well, I'm here. This is actually not my usual office. I'm visiting Keio University in Tokyo. Actually, this is the Yokohama campus just south of Tokyo. And this sort of bare shelves behind me are part of the one of the visiting professors' offices where people kind of come in and out of. Though I suppose it hasn't been used much in recent years because Japan just sort of reopened to uh, non-Japanese visitors over the last few months. Yeah, that's fantastic. And we know about it because FT is owned by Nick Kay. We are on literally two corners of the world. Our team as well is connected from the US. We are a super international podcast and that's why we love this. A global team and who better than you to be connected from Tokyo and speaking with me in London to talk about international firms, to talk about growth, to talk about strategy. Perfect setting for doing such a conversation. About your story, you moved from the US to Italy and now you're living in a European context. Can you talk about adapting to new cultures from a business perspective? Yes. I mean, from a business and personal perspective, it takes a lot of energy. If you're coming from another country, it will take some portion of your energy and time to handle this adaptation. It's just a cost that will be imposed on you. Now, hopefully, you're going to a place that you enjoy enough that there's a payoff to that, but there is a cost. And I think you need to keep that in mind as well. It's one of the classic ideas from international business is this liability of foreignness. You know, we tend to think of multinationals as these big, powerful players, and they are that, but you need to remember they're actually paying a cost when they operate in some country outside of their home country. They never kind of manage to adapt quite as perfectly as local companies. Now, why are they so powerful and successful? It's because they do something so useful and so valuable that others can't, but they're always just facing some cost underneath that. And so you don't want to go international unless you have some big advantage you're bringing to that market because of that additional cost you'll play outside that. I'm going to take this also in a bit of a personal direction. I will say, you know, from, you know, my own personal experience of moving from the U.S. To, uh, to Italy. I mean, there's a couple of lessons I would, I would highlight. One, it takes time. It really, I mean, I think I had some fantasy, oh, in two or three years, I'll be fluent and I'll understand things. And I often jokingly tell people the low moment of my adaptation is probably six or 12 months in, I'm getting some language, I'm starting to get some basic cultural understanding. I thought the payoff would be, I would really understand how things work much better. Instead, I'm starting to find that Italians are confused a lot of time as well. It's not an information-rich culture. It's not an easy place to understand. And uh, I, I really felt like all this investment, all this work, and I'm still very confused about how things actually work here, what's going on. Now, I will say, after 11 years in Italy, I probably don't feel confused as much as I did then. It does really take some time to get used to and adapt to a new culture. And here I have a question for you that might be something that our listeners can relate to. When we are in a, our early career days, the goal and the prospect and what we have is the world is at your disposal in a certain sense. And we always want to have, you know, an international path and journey. And this is quite similar to what happens as well to companies as they grow, right? From a local market, they want to expand internationally. My question is, 
What can international managers or people that want to be through an international path do to better understand the culture and how to adapt to that? What would you do from a business person perspective and as a business itself? Well, I mean, I guess that would bring me right to my second piece of advice, which is I think sometimes you see when people come to a new place, they sit around and complain a lot about how are things are different because it's frustrating. At times it's mysterious, it's tiring, and everybody needs to get together with people like them and have a bitch fest every so often. But you don't want to settle into that as a basic way of relating to a different place. There's a logic for how people behave in different circumstances. And there may well be very different definitions of what makes a good person, what makes an effective person, how many things we need to sort of consider as we're planning something, all these can be different across another culture. And so I think you want to make it a puzzle first and foremost. When you see something that bothers you or mystifies you, start asking and thinking about and observing, like, why is this happening? How do people think about this as an approach to things? And sometimes we see people missing between the cultures that they assume are going to be more similar. And so I think, in fact, Americans going to London assume it's going to be very similar. My own PhD advisor did a study of Canadian firms coming to the U.S. He found the same thing. They tended to over-assume that it was going to be the same as the Canadian market, and it would work really similarly. Instead, they got tripped up by a lot of the important economic differences. So you need to study, ask people, explore whatever you can, and every time you get a piece of information, try to kind of slot it into that. I had one last piece of advice just on kind of dealing with this. Claim your space. And that, what I mean by that is when you are international, you also get permission to be a little weird, a little different, and you need that. You know, you're not going to understand. You're never going to be quite as good an Italian as an Italian or as good a Japanese as a Japanese person or a good kind of a Londoner as someone who's kind of local and from there. And so you want to claim your space and there will really be the, an expectation that you'll act different as an outsider. And that can be a very powerful and useful thing. So, so you don't feel like you always need to fit in, kind of uh, do your own thing, but then explain it to other people. And that can actually be quite successful as well. Charlie, I cannot agree more. I think out of our own uh, identity and differences, rather than, you know, trying to enter into this uh, homogeneous way of behaving is actually our different way of being, of course, without being disrespectful, is actually an asset. And I have a, a bit of a personal question for you, Charlie. How do you claim your space? How have you been claiming your space? Oh, that's so interesting. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. I, um, <laughs> have you been the weird that. American yeah. in the room? Or <laughs> When he was talking about hiring other international people, he did say, you know, we need sort of slightly unusual, kind of weird people like Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is I'm doing, it's definitely coming off as weird. The, I, I would say it's also made me, I mean, just in a very specifically, a little more comfortable with the language. I spent a lot of time wanting to be as correct and educated as I am in English. And, you know, I'm a professor. I like sounding smart. You know, like, you don't get into this field if you don't. And I sound, I sound kind of stupid and uneducated in Italian. I make a lot of mistakes and... I finally, and, and I don't understand the subtleties of what's going on around me. And I really have finally just come to terms with that. I suppose I've given up a little bit that um, attachment to always being the smart one and knowing exactly what's going on, that I'm going to kind of, you know, just bluster my way along and misunderstand a lot of things and we'll figure it out eventually. And, uh, you know, I think as much as that sounds a little sad, it's actually been a gift as well. But actually, you know, this goes quite hand in hand with the new rise of the humble leadership or this new model of being vulnerable, be a person rather than the role and what is your role in society. And I think this is really interesting, you know, because being able to be vulnerable and speaking another language and still be the best self in what you're trying to apply. And still, at the end of the day, your knowledge, the know-how, the kind of hard skills and things that you have learned are something that you can apply just in different languages with different methodologies. But I think it shows as well more of a personal stake in the conversation that makes you stand in another area. But I think if you have a smart interlocutor with you, it will definitely get, you know, you're pushing yourself harder outside of a comfort zone. 
thinking about multinationals, so we talked about, you know, going global, but at the same time with a race of nationalism and in a certain sense of popularism as well, these new closed walls on thinking, what problems do multinationals face today with the new political rising trends of nationalism? This is the question of the moment, right? We thought we were going towards this future where we're becoming more and more economically connected, and that would mean more and more kind of political similarity and more and more kind of institutional similarity. And we see there's been a hard stop in that. And we certainly see kind of Russia going in other directions. We really wonder if China is taking a more authoritarian turn. The, so the deepest question then is, to what extent is this going to lead to a real separation of the two economic systems, you know, and certainly some people are out there predicting, you know, we're going to end up with, with somewhat separate internets and, and fairly separate economic systems. The problem is kind of many people have said, you know, making predictions is hard, especially about the future. No one really knows exactly where this will end. It leads to a complete unraveling and separation of the international trade system. I really think that will be an economic disaster from both sides. And so I really hope it doesn't go that far. The integration of China has led to one of the largest, greatest increases in wealth of really, really poor people in China that we've ever seen. You know, one of the greatest reduction in misery and poverty the world has ever seen. I hope we don't end up there. The truth is no one really knows how far down this road we will end up, you know, because people do things that are counter to their own interests. Most of us think it was a grave error on Putin's part to invade Ukraine. He really had a different calculus that he thought he could do it easily and the West wouldn't react much. And it turned out very different. And yet, once you've started with a mistake, it's very hard to back out. So we don't really know, are there stopping points in this? Clearly, there's some separation, some distance is happening that wasn't there before. I will say the big thing for multinational supply chains and they're actually being rebuilt as we speak because everyone is so deathly afraid of this. And there's been so many supply chain shocks and challenges just over the last few years with COVID, with the sort of other crises that are, that are ongoing in this period. These supply chains are being rebuilt for um, redundancy and optionality so that basically you're never completely reliant on one country or one location for most of your manufacturing. That's a big change in kind of attitude of multinationals. It's going to require a lot more adaptability on their part. In terms of people and the kind of managers that do need to take these new decisions due to unpredictable events, these black swans in the market as well, how can managers prepare themselves if you had a younger person that wants to be that international leader? What they should be studying? Yeah, what should they be studying? <laughs> that's, um, that's tricky. I mean, I suppose in some sense, history, I found myself turning to history lectures a lot. I listened to audiobooks and the Audible subscription comes with a lot of kind of great courses, history lectures. So I've been listening to everything from Russian history, Japanese history, medieval and Renaissance European history, finally learning a bit of my Italian history through this. You know, I do think it gives you some perspective. This is this hardly is the only time that Europe or the world has been through major shocks. You know, we think it's you know, there's sort of a crisis of every generation. And this is certainly ours. And it's a really challenging and important one. But it's not necessarily world ending that humanity has sort of faced and handled, managed big changes and crises in the past. We will again. So that's on the one side, just kind of having a longer perspective. This doesn't have to be deeply frightening shock. You know, I think from COVID to war to the repressive ways we're seeing the internet used right now, there could be a real feeling of betrayal. Like I thought things were supposed to get better and they're not. We need to move beyond that and really start to say, okay, but how can I play a better, more adaptable role in this? That's the one side, the sort of historic side of things. In terms of skills, I mean, I do think that people who can see options, that entrepreneurship, we often talk about intrapreneurship, being an entrepreneur inside a large company, it's going to demand that more than ever these days. You may, you know, um, Tim Cook, 
made his career at Apple by really building China supply for Apple. And Apple managed to have these highly differentiated products that are incredibly high quality and people will pay an enormous amount. And yet they're manufactured at very low cost, mostly in China. That kind of specialization just in one place, we probably aren't going to see anymore because Apple now is very much exposed having so much of its production right there in one country that now is at odds with Apple's own home market of the United States. So I think we're going to see people who maybe have international careers that span locations more, that kind of reach into different places because you're going to need to have many more or multinationals themselves are going to need to have many more relationships as they built their supply and just their overall ecosystem of the company. I think this is so interesting. First of all, what you mentioned about history is a bit of a common thread in all our podcast episodes. Being able to read the map of the past events, I really suggest to our listeners to check out our very first episode with David Serra that is talking about history as well in the financial ecosystem. I have one last question for you. It's very hard to accept mistakes or at least admit something is not working. If there is something that you are an expert, it's about entering new market, but also exiting markets where you have established your company. I have a question for you. You pushed as a company to enter a market, you try to succeed there. How do you realize and how do you take the courage to exit a market that is not working? Yeah, this is really hard because we tend to think of exit as something that's indication of failure by the company. And yet when we look and what companies are actually doing, we find healthy companies are exiting from markets. And that's because if you think about good corporate strategy at the moment, you're going to try a lot of different things, especially in a digital world. It doesn't cost you that much to try different services, to launch different products. But at some point, you're going to get such an array, such a diversity that it can be really overwhelming and very distracting for managers who are trying to to say, focus the firm where it's most successful, where it's creating the most value, where its future may lie. And so companies that are successful need to exit businesses as well as those that are failing. In fact, we can see different effects of exit, whether it's kind of successful companies or unsuccessful, unprofitable companies. Companies are leaving businesses just because they're not making money. You know, they tend to reduce their losses, but they don't see much long-term strategic benefit. But successful companies who leave businesses, we actually see them doing some deepening of their competitive advantage, their competitive resources in other areas, some more innovating, some more investment in the other areas of the business, looking like they're really kind of focusing their resources where it matters most. So the most important thing is just reconceptualizing, remembering that exit is not always failure for a company. Sometimes it's just a very important rationalization that needs to happen. And that's what is at the basis of how do you do corporate development strategy and how you make them effective in an international and global context. So thank you so much. If there is something special about the talent show is that we have our challengers around the world asking directly to our experts like you, Charlie, questions. So for you today, we have two questions, one from Sarah and one from Alexander. Sarah, over to you. Hello, my name is Sara Danese. I was a participant of the Financial Times for Made in Italy challenge. I am originally Italian, but I've lived in London for 10 years now. And a few years ago, I set up a startup called Asia, and we export and sell wines in China via social media and e-commerce only. So my question for Professor Charles Williams is, well, given the different economic regimes in these two parts of the world, how does a company that is looking to transition from a growth state to profitability can best position itself given these inflationary headwinds, especially when trading uh, with economies that have lower inflation, such as China? Well, thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing your answer. Thank you. Well, Sarah, thank you for the question. And I will say European and Italian wines are very close to my heart. And I have been amazed, I mean, even coming here to Tokyo just recently, when you walk into fine groceries, I've been amazed how many fine wines and European wines are right there in the grocery stores. I hadn't expected that to be as popular here as it seems to be. 
And I imagine there's the potential as China becomes a higher and higher income country for the same there. So it seems like potentially very exciting as well as emotional business to be in. But it is true that working across these different economic regimes where things are so different and where the headwinds, the economic headwinds are so strong in the West, in Europe and North America right now, maybe not quite as strong yet in Asia and China in particular, can be quite challenging. As you framed it, your question, how do we shift from growth to profitability? That's an interesting transition, actually, because growth is costly. Usually we find we're actually investing a lot to maintain growth, to find new opportunities, to have the inventory to handle growth. And so when we do valuations of companies, this moment of transition from growth to sort of steady state profitability is actually one where there's a bit of a windfall for the company. So there's a potential to actually reduce the amount of working capital you're using that actually ends up being something that goes to the, uh, the profit of the company. The other thing that you really want to do sometimes during a growth phase, as we were just talking about when we were talking about exit, you may have gotten into businesses that you know seemed like they might lead somewhere. They maybe weren't terribly profitable at the beginning. You were hoping they would lead something else, but haven't done so as much as you hoped. And so having a very good idea of what are your margins and all the different segments that you're selling into, which are your most profitable, and so really trying to grow in those segments, and which are not your good areas of business where your margins are low or even non-existent, you may find that during this period, you need to fire some customers. It's always hard to do. You're very attached to that. But if you're not making money of them, you really want to focus your energy where the returns are greatest and see if you can eke more growth maybe not quite as dramatic, but more profitable growth out of those segments. Thank you very much, Charlie. Second question from Alexander. Hello, I'm Alexander Friends. I was part of the FT Bocconi Challenge in 2022. I'm originally from Germany, just finished university. Now I'm living in London and I work at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. My question to you, Professor Charles, is referring to the TED Talk you gave at Bocconi University, where you refer to the anecdote of David and Goliath. Yeah, keeping here the unequal find in mind, I wanted to know how can small to mid-cap companies foster a culture of excellence given that they face natural restraints, such as lower budgets for recruiting, developing or retaining their talent? Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to hearing your answer. Thank you, Alexander. As you mentioned, this is a question that is very close to my heart. I think it's very interesting how small and medium-sized companies can compete with the really big dominant players in a segment, and they can. So I want to focus on two sides of your question. The first is how do they compete? And what you want to do is understand that these big players are much less flexible in some way. There are parts of the market they just can't serve as well as a more flexible, more specialized, kind of more savvy small player can. And so when you start to figure those out, what are the segments they have trouble reaching? Think about the things that you could be doing that your mid-size or small company could really be doing to uniquely reach those that will then be difficult for these big players who are really trying to serve everyone to match as effectively. So the first is really build a business model around unique value for segments that the big players really have trouble matching. The other piece you mentioned in the question was building a culture of excellence. This also is very important and close to my heart because culture can be a really important side of strategy execution. But I want to kind of take you away from this generic term of excellence because excellence can mean basically so many different things to so many different people. It's really broad and we see people calling for this. You know, we just all want to be excellent. But what that means for your business should be very different than, say, what it means for some big dominant player. Once you've figured out what your business model is, what you want is the kind of culture that supports the choices and trade-offs that are really crucial for your strategy. Now, that may be about you know, combining value in certain ways and maybe about reaching customers in certain settings or positions that others can't reach out to them. 
but the specific values that underpin that are going to be different than those that a bigger player might have. And so I'd encourage you to think about fitting culture to your strategy. And that's where you really end up getting execution value from the culture in your organization. Now, there is another side of culture, which we talk about as well. It's sometimes referred to as climate, but people confuse it with what it really say matters for strategy execution. Climate is more just about making the company a good and enjoyable and fun, satisfying place to work. I have no problem with that. I think companies should do that, but you should think of that as a way of sharing some of the success and profit of the company. We're going to make this place great and really satisfying to work at because of your human value. People want that in addition to the salaries that they earn with the company. It's not something that creates unique value for the company. There you need values that are much more specifically targeted to the kind of business model, the kind of strategy that you're developing. Charlie, thank you very much for answering all the questions. I really appreciate your time with us today. I really hope you enjoy it. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. What a great opportunity. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in. Check out our website, ftalent.ft.com, for any upcoming editions of our challenge. We are spreading our wings around the world. Check out for the next edition, apply and be part of the Challenge Network. This has been the Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent Team, Aya Al-Shihabi, Noor Hafez, and me, Virginia Stani. Our podcast producer is Todd Van Luling. Our editor and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa. Our video producer is Enrique Zecca. And our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time and keep listening.